God's omniscience as we began this last Lord's Day evening, which we know when we speak of the omniscience of God, we are but simply speaking of God knowing everything perfectly, God knowing everything exhaustively, comprehensively. This God in whom we serve is a God where nothing is hid from him, his knowledge, and has no need to learn anything outside of his knowledge, since certainly he has nothing to learn from his creation. He has known all things from the start. And scripture describes this God of wisdom, our Lord of glory. In 1 Samuel 2, 3, as I had mentioned last Lord's Day evening, but to bring reminder to you, he is known as a God of knowledge. According to Job 37, 16, he is who is perfect in knowledge. The apostle John speaks that when we are condemned in our own hearts, in 1 John 3, 20, that our God, he knows everything. And in Psalm 147, 4, it is an understanding so marvelous that even determines the number of the stars and he knows them by name. In verse five of the same chapter, his understanding there is considered beyond infinite. Beyond measure is, is, is what the psalmist says. According to the word of God through Isaiah, the questions have been risen. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man has shown him, uh, shows, uh, shows his counsel? Who did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and shown him the way of understanding? None. It came, uh, it was all there from the start. The justice, the mercy, the holiness of God, the understanding of God. Isaiah 55, 9, it is a mind higher than our thoughts. Isaiah 46, 10, a mind that declares the end from the beginning, which eliminates all the worries of life, which eliminates all the anxieties of life to know that our end, our destiny, our glory has been determined. All things that will happen in time has have been determined by God from the beginning. But yet what is distinct about God from all humanity of all rational beings is that God knows himself, which we as men struggle already to know our own minds. We are inconstant. We don't even know what we thought of this morning. And to know the fullness of our spirit is quite difficult to us, but with God, he knows everything about himself, his excellencies, his operations. And I had mentioned to you that if there's anything that God must first know, it is that first and glorious truth that is about himself, for all things come out of the knowledge of himself. And yet it is a mind that knows all animals from the hills to the birds of the sky and all human beings made in his image and likeness. And in this psalm, David being the one who wrote this psalm, or the inspiration of David in this psalm, we learn that David acknowledges the brilliance of God's mind because God is not only behind the formation and the detail of the making of humanity, but he knows the very contents within the chambers that he had fashioned according to his will and purpose. All those thoughts that are in our minds presently, those hidden secrets that are in the depths of our soul, he knows them all. And David praises this God because out of all of the details and the knowledge of God, the comprehensive knowledge of God, within his mind, he knows you personally. He knows you by name. He gave you life and he brought you into existence. And even more, not just into existence, but into life, salvation, that you may be with him for all of eternity. And so just like David, verse 17, he says, how precious to me are your thoughts. And it should be for all of us who consider the excellency of God, the omniscience of God, to never get tired of hearing of it, to always marvel at the beauty of it and how precious are his thoughts. He says, oh God, how vast is the sum of them. And in verse 18, if I count, if I would count them, they are more than the sand. And like David, we should not only be mesmerized at the fact that God knows our internal thoughts, our internal desires, or the rhythm of our lives, but that he may lead us to pray like him in verse 23 and 24, to search us. And you see, that's the great question every time we come here to learn, and anything we've come to learn uh, in all of our meetings. What do we do, specifically Lord's Day evenings, with the attributes of God? What do we do with the excellencies of God? Do we store them but just for knowledge so that we can refer to them when it's time to speak on them? Or should it do something to the, the saint that hears about his excellency? 
What I love about the writings of Stephen Sharnock is that at the end of each, in comparison to Pink's and um, Tozer's writing on this, or Sproul, he always specifically leads or uh, leaves a portion of his writing to remind the saint of the use of this knowledge. The words you hear this evening mean nothing to you if right now it is just going to leave your mind the moment you walk out these doors. It should do something to you. And this evening, the intent of our learning or study should lead us to a personal examination, having God to search us, and yet even to be sensitive, to be so careful and cautious of the things that we think about, those desires that we harbor in our hearts. The question I have for you this evening is those thoughts that you keep secretly in your mind, those hidden thoughts that are not visible that are not heard by your own loved ones, those in your own home. Have you ever considered being cautious about the things you entertain in your mind? Have you ever considered being cautious of the desires that you allow to enter into your heart? We learned about God's omnipresence and we learned about trembling at every action that we commit to being that God sees all things. But what about those things hidden in the chambers of our hearts? Have we considered to tremble in fear, considering that God actually sees and knows the very contents within those chambers? And so tonight, we're going to learn about our response. What is the use of the omniscience of God? It is far beyond just knowing that He knows all things. But to you, who learns of them, to tremble in fear of the God who knows all things. And so we must consider what David says in verse 23 and 24, that it may lead us to that, that we may pray to God to search us. Not that God has anything to know about us that he does not already know, but that we would know for ourselves that we stand purely before an all-knowing God. That's the point there. When David is saying, search me and see if there be any grievous way, he was really assuring for himself that he stood purely before an all-knowing God. And that's the question I have for you. Do you have confidence that before the all-knowing God that you, stood pu- that you stand purely and even to the point that you have to ask him to search if there's any grievous way in me, in you, because you are even sure about it? And so that's the whole point of that, to consider whether we stand right before an all-knowing God, and that it may lead us to a great humbling, an examination of our own selves, that before we entertain thoughts, before we imagine things, before we plan things, that we would consider whether they are grieving or pleasing to the Almighty God. And so tonight we will study of God's knowledge of, the, of our hearts, whether, of, uh, whether good or evil is within our minds or our, hot, our hearts. Those thoughts that are unobservable, those um, traits of our true selves that are unseen to the human eye are not hid from him. And so the question is, if we know that he framed and created humanity, do we really think he has no access to these things? One great Puritan said that he must know what is in your heart, for by it you will be judged on the day of judgment. Having no access will give him no basis to judge you, aside from the fact that you are a sinner. But he has written all things, not just your works, but the very thoughts, the very desires, the very imaginations, all of those things. And believe it, I believe none of us have ever thought of it in this way where we were so careful and cautious of every single thought. This is why the psalmist in 33.15 says, He who fashions the hearts of them all observes their deeds. He fashioned your hearts. He fashioned your minds. And if he structured it, he surely knows what's in it. And so that is something to consider. First of all, God's knowledge tells us by his word that he knows the evil within man. Let's look into Genesis chapter 6. The day of Noah where God called Noah to himself, warning the the people of danger. And yet the the state of the heart of those in the days of Noah 
are described in verse 5 of chapter 6. The Word of God says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great, and he saw every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is not just of in one individual, but individuals as a whole. If God knows the men and women in the days of Noah, he certainly knows man in general, humanity, all of humanity. In Matthew 24, the Lord says that in the days of Noah, all these men and women were doing was drinking, eating, and giving into marriage. They had no worries whatsoever of the warnings that were being given by Noah, whom they considered crazy. But yet God read the heart. He saw, the, he saw every thought, the detail and the intentions of it. And that's what should cause us to marvel about this excellency of God. Every word, every thought, every desire, the most simplest thought, the ones you are even thinking at the moment in, re in reception of the words that I'm giving you tonight, He knows. And that's why we should marvel at this excellency. He knows the depravity of man. He knows the dead state of the unregenerate. Yet he, he, well, he well as knows, oh, sorry, he knows as well the sins of the regenerate and the negligence of his people. Even us who are saved unto himself, he knows every grievous work. Job 11.11, 11, for he knows worthless men when he sees iniquity. In other translations, he knows vain men. He knows common men. He knows the average man. When he sees iniquity, the question is, he says in Job 11, will he not consider it? it means God is sensitive to sin. He is, he is sensitive to iniquity. And there is no sin, no thought, no intention of evil that is in man that God does not pay a close attention to. He is sensitive to them. And so I begin first with what? Our murderous thoughts. I say that God being all, all wise, all knowing, knows of our murderous thoughts. When we collect hatred toward our neighbors, when we are annoyed of them, irritated by them, when we hold bitterness toward them, we may be silent experts, but experts of internal murders and slanders. God knows. And we are reminded that such individual, because God knows, such individuals are worthy of judgment, according to Matthew 5.22. The Lord Jesus Christ says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And he may not have murdered physically, but God on the day of judgment will judge him on the thoughts and the intents of his very heart. And it will all be exposed when all of the years that we have been on this earth, we have hid our private thoughts from man. On that day of judgment, it will all be exposed. And there, if we do not believe that he is a wise God in this life, on the day of judgment, we will consider him. We will acknowledge that he truly is the only wise God. Not just of the sins at that present day of judgment, but all sins in all of your years. Not just one man, but all of humanity before him on the day of judgment. He is a God of all wisdom, never forgetful, but to the saved, all gracious. But those murderous thoughts that we harbor, he knows. Those simplest, oh, those simple murderous thoughts. John says in chapter 3, verse 15, 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And we know according to scripture that no murderer will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Not only this, but even in the conflicts of the church, the inner quarrelings of the church, the Holy Spirit through the apostle James reveals God's knowledge of knowing why the church entered into great conflicts. Turn with me to James chapter 4, please. James 4, we should not read this 
chapter as though James is assuming what is, in within, uh, what is within the hearts of those who quarrel, but it is revelation from the Holy Spirit to reveal what is truly within. Verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You see, there's desire that is known. And the inward act, murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And later on, it speaks of them not receiving because their minds are everywhere. Double-mindedness in the early chapters of James, unstable in all ways. God knows within. Brethren, God is not stupid. He is not foolish. He knows our thoughts. He knows the strong passions. He knows the covetous intentions. He knows the, the things that stir within our hearts, that are bottled within and are ready to explode. Again, silent experts, but experts of harboring within, God sees all. He knows not only of the passions that cause strife within the body, but he even knows the adulterous thoughts. He knows how the adulterer rises, rises out of his bed to commit the very things that he would desire to commit. He knows how the adulterer strategizes his ways to avoid his wife from knowing. And then the steps he takes to execute the adultery. And God's knowledge is not just the bulk of sin, but every single black spot within the bulk. Consider that. God does not just know of adultery or murder or covetousness. He knows every step, every dark spot that led up to the bulk of our sins. Everything. Even the slightest thought. I was, we were talking to one woman and she is saying, well, it's not really me, it's them when it came to her gross sins. But that's where it leads. It begins somewhere. It begins with a short statement like that, it begins with a small intention like that and it boils up to a greater bulk of sin. God knows all of it. All the dark patches of our sins. He knows of every man who looks at a woman with lustful intentions. When you're at the mall, when you're at the park, when you're at the beach. He knows when those eyes are roaming around lusting after what is not yours. He says he knows who looks at a woman with lustful intent. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 28, he knows those who committed adultery with them in his heart or in, in, in their hearts. They are not only looking, but they're already playing with the imagination in their hearts. And though it might be an excitement to the one hiding it in his chamber, private chamber, God is watching all of it. How do we know so? Did we not read or do we not know of God seeing the intents of David's heart? In 2 Samuel 11, his strategy that led up to the bulk of his sin to get rid of Uriah, to put him in the front of the, the, arm, uh, the battle just so that he can satisfy his inner passions. Those passions that were birthed on the day that he saw the bathing Bathsheba. Those little dark spots, God knew. And how do we know that God knew? Well, Samuel wrote, well, not Samuel, 2 Samuel, but we believe either Nathan the prophet may have wrote 2 Samuel, but one writer was inspired to give us the details of the account. So if God knows the adultery of a man who is considered to be after his own heart, and then surely he knows the adultery of our own hearts. And not only the adultery of our thoughts or the adulterous thoughts, but he knows of our doubtful and anxious minds. Living in a world of sin, living in a world that does not go in our way, he knows of our doubtful and anxious minds. We know this because scripture tells us that God will not answer the doubtful. James 1, 6 to 8 for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. 
We pray to the Lord, we ask of Him of these certain things, but we do not depend upon Him and His excellency. We pray, but then we doubt. We pray, but we are concerned and worried. We want to take it into our own hands, the matters into our own hands. And James, by the Holy Spirit, says that man is a double-minded man. He is confused whether he will trust God's excellencies or he will trust in his own hand. He knows whether you truly believe him to be God or not. The question is, do you truly believe in his excellencies? When we are told in Proverbs 3 to trust in him in all of our ways, acknowledge him, is that really so? When you entertain those things, I mean, just look all over Facebook and you'll see what's in the minds and the hearts of men, right? It's, it's, it's a circus. You have one concerned about conspiracies. You have one concerned about the morning news. You have one concerned about someone getting robbed on the street this morning. Everyone is concerned about something. But for the believer, it should not be so. We must be examples of those who trust in the Lord, who know the one in whom we believe. But God knows that heart of yours, whether you receive this knowledge to the trusting in God or due to the doubt of God. This week, the Lord made it very clear, either by the hymns or the Psalms, Psalm 11, whether we truly trust him to be the God in his temple. We sang it this morning. Father is in his temple. The Son is in his temple. And the Holy Spirit is in his temple. Do you doubt his ability? Are we like the psalmist in chapter 12 who sees that the righteous has vanished, but then he reminds himself that the Lord says he will arise and he will take the poor who are plundered and he will set them to the place where they long to be? He knows if you are in your mind at peace with his excellencies. He knows and not only that, but he knows of our covetous and idolatrous thoughts. And those thoughts, before we even act them, God is not just knowledgeable because of observance at the present hour that we've committed the act, but he even knows our thoughts before we thought them. That's the beauty of God, especially in redemption, that he would forgive us of our sins, even of the sins that we are not aware that we would do and commit and even entertain before we even think of them. Deuteronomy 31, please. Let's turn there and, sh and I'll show you what I'm referring to. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16. Are you still all alive? Yes. At the end of this evening, it'll look like we all had a shower. <laughs> Deuteronomy 31, He knows our thoughts even before we have thought of them or acted upon them. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel, Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring." For I know what they are inclined to do even today before I brought them into the land that I swore to give. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. You see, long before Moses dies, long before Joshua leads the people of God to the land flowing of milk and honey, God already knows the thoughts that will 
be placed in the mind of the children of Israel thoughts of idolatry, thoughts of atheism, to doubt that God was even with them. And he says, write this song to confront them as a living proof that I knew their thoughts before they even thought it. I knew of their sin before they even committed it. I knew their hearts before they even desired it. He is all wise. He knows if we will end up idolizing all of our blessings, our money, our career, our position, the world, the people around us. He knows from a distance. This is why Psalm 139 is not really considered in its fullness. When it says I, he knows our thoughts from afar, he definitely knows them from afar. Only a wise God can know my thoughts next year and my sins tomorrow. So then if we know that he knows our sin before we do them, should we not cry what the psalmist said in 139, 23, 24? Search me, O God, should we not cry that all the more, knowing that he knows our thoughts before we even think them? Does this not make you feel naked? Feel exposed, broken about yourself, miserable about those thoughts and imaginations? Miserable about the things that we entertain within the chambers of our hearts. You see, he knew of the betraying thoughts of Judas before his actual existence. Psalm 41 9, my closest friend will betray me and hand me over to my enemies. Our Lord Jesus Christ knew of Judas' acts of betrayal before he even finished his scheme. He sold his Lord, but before his Lord was arrested, what did Jesus say in John 13, 27 to his betrayer? What you are going to do, do quickly. The omniscience, omniscience of God implies so many things. The omniscience of God shows us that Christ is God. Why? Because when Christ was on the earth, that revelation of God in his heart and even the heart of man is revealed. And so you realize this omniscience, the subject of omniscience reveals Christ's deity as well. He knows whether today you are pretending to be of Christ or not, just like Judas. He knows whether you will betray months later or you will remain as faithful sheep. He knows if you're sitting here for show, for men, or for the glory of God. Whether you care about these seats being empty, and that being the only reason why you're motivated to have church, or whether you can care less if you're the only one in the room, alone with the word of God, being fed the word of God. He knows whether you are here for his glory genuinely, and he knows if today you are feeding that heart and mind with deception. And like I said, if you do not want to believe that he knows what's inside your mind and heart now, you can get away with it from, from your loved ones, your pastor and those around you, but on the day of judgment, he will reveal. Then you will believe that he surely knows you. Secondly, not only the evil, not only does it convict us of our anxiety, our murderous thoughts, our lustful hearts, but God knows the good within man as well. And when I speak of the good within man, I'm not speaking of the common good that is bestowed upon all men. I'm speaking of the good of his saints. God knows, and he has to know, good of all the, uh, of the motions of, my, uh, of, of the man's mind and the will of man. And this is certain because God himself is the one who instills the good within men. Right? So he has to know what is good. Luke 18, 19, no one is good except God alone. To say I'm good apart from God is not possible. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, from coming down from the Father of lights. So God knows the good within his saints. You don't need to be, as Jesus warns the hypocrites in Matthew 6, as those who trumpet their good works. You can be in private. You can be a faithful woman of prayer. A faithful man of God who's faithful to his word, and you do not need to blow your trumpet. God knows the very heart of man that leads to the good of God's people and of his own soul. 
He knows if you are a man who fears him. He knows if you are a woman that trusts in him. None of it needs to be proclaimed to the world. He knows it. He knew David. He knew David's heart when he led his people. Psalm 78, please. Psalm chapter 78. Verse 70. I mean, the Lord knew many more people in this chapter if you would just have the time to read the entirety of it. Uh, but here specifically with David, Psalm 78, 70. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. Do you remember that story? When the prophet came over to the house of Jesse and his brothers of great stature were all greater, it seemed, apparently against David in comparison to David, but God knew of David, a faithful shepherd of his flock. And now in verse 71, from following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. You see, God knew that David was not just doing his duty before men, but God knew that David Encourage that we live unto God's eyes alone. He knows of our thoughts and our desires, those thoughts where we want the sheep to follow faithfully, those prayers and tears that we lift unto the Lord in private. He knows them. We don't need to beg men and tell them of what we do in private. He knows the good within because He instills the good within. Let's look at God's knowledge of Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, please. 2 Kings chapter 20. <clears throat> Verse 1. Remember when sickness came upon Hezekiah and his life was to be taken away from him. Look at his request to the Lord. 2 Kings 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add fifteen years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. You see? God confirmed the faithfulness of this man as he prayed to the Lord concerning his steps. Now, I'm not saying this should be a regular routine for us to add 15 years Especially in this generation, it's much better to go. <laughs> but the point is that God knows his children. He knows the good that is within them. Peter himself confessed of this in John chapter 21. Remember when the Lord asked him multiple times, do you love me? And the word of God says Peter was grieved because he said to, the, to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, you know that I love you. And this should be then taken as an encouragement for all of you who truly have a heart genuinely in love with God. We do not need to justify ourselves before men. Just as he is knowledgeable of the thoughts of the evil, he is as knowledgeable of the thoughts of the righteous. He knows your intentions. He knows the righteous thoughts and desires 
and those actions, for they are the fruit of his righteousness. They are the fruit of salvation. They are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, seen in Galatians 5.22. He knows who he has saved, justified, and made alive. He knows, according to Matthew 6, those who approach him in private. And again, as I said last Lord's Day evening, he knows those thoughts as you're receiving these words. Is there a hunger as you receive those words? Thank you, Lord, for your all-knowing ability. Being the only wise God who is excellent. You know my thoughts. Examine me at this hour as I hear this preacher. And all those grievous ways in me, reveal them, O God. You know my delight is in your law. He knows of our obedience. Husbands, he knows if you love your wives and children and are truly providing for them, leading them in the way everlasting. He knows the hours when you pray for your children and you offer those spiritual sacrifices for your children's sins and your wives' sins and you pray in private to the Lord because you love your own home, your church within the home, and you pray and God sees that in your obedience. Wives, he sees your obedience when you are submissive to your husbands, when you desire not to rule over him, but to hear his words, especially if a man of God, that he receives the word of God and you thank the Lord for his life, that you submit to him that obedience in private is seen to, in the, uh, before the Lord. Children, he knows whether you honor your mother and father truly or you despise them. If you love them with all your heart for the sacrifice that they have done for your own sake, if you are obedient to them of the, in their requests, of their observances, of what they advise, he knows whether you're really honoring your parents. Workers, those of employment, he knows if you are faithful to your employers. He knows if you are faithful to the recipients of service. He knows those things you do, those jobs that are in the office hid away from everyone seeing you. And where there you are anxious and stomping your feet. Well, man, nobody knows that I'm doing all this hard work. I deserve a raise. Da, da, da. Well, if you do them obediently, God knows even there your diligence. Church, he knows if you esteem your servant well. He knows when you consider the words that God has given your servant to speak to your own very soul, even when you think you don't need to hear them. He knows when you consider your brethren in Christ, when you seek to build them up in the Lord, he knows it all. Brethren, this is a knowledge too well, too big for us to contain. It is too high. And when we're speaking of his omniscience, there's too much to speak about to exhaust it. That's why I'm not even going to attempt. But the very thing I find important when we speak of his omniscience is that what is the use of it? Again, knowing that he knows us personally, what should it lead you to do? To be cautious of your ways, to be cautious of your thoughts, to be cautious of those desires and imaginations. Next Lord's Day, we'll speak of the next use of the innocence of God, and that is comfort, like all of the attributes that we've talked about. There's comfort in knowing that he is all-knowing. But brethren, I pray that you leave these doors tonight with the feeling of wanting to weep, not because I told you to weep, because we are naked before him. We are broken. Where shall we hide and run from him who is all-knowing? I pray that this word will lead you to pray to God and say, my life is naked before you, almighty God. You know all about me. I don't know myself. I pray then that you reveal to me the hidden things of my heart. Show me the direction of my life. As you see where I'm headed in this life, you know all things. 
Oh, so then, wise God, lead me into life everlasting. Oh, I pray, read Psalm 139 on your own. Read the, the, the very structure of that chapter and see where David is marveling at the brilliance of his maker just to find out at the end that he will take this high knowledge of God so that he could examine his own heart before him who is all-knowing. So what should we do with God's word tonight? Search me. Search me. Know me. And reveal the things that bring dishonor. Lest I am ignorant of your knowledge and I mock you of your great infinite wisdom. Help me deny my anxiety. Help me deny my lust. Help me deny my doubt of you. May my thoughts only be in the trusting of my God. Be cautious of those thoughts like never before. Believe me, after this I pray, the Holy Spirit would give you such security and conviction that even after we pray, you dare not to think something that will not line up with his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word, these personal words you've given us. We are not exempt from sinning. We are men yet of the flesh. You know the thoughts of the unregenerate, you know their dead state, but you definitely know even those who are made alive, our stumblings, our thoughts, our intentions. And if there's anything we've learned in scripture is that even in the church, in all the epistles of the New Testament, the church is a problematic people, a people who have hidden thoughts, secrets, but yet you who are all-knowing knows them all. Rid us of our iniquities, we pray. Help us revere the all-knowing God like we've never revered you before. Let us not just store this knowledge to think that you know all things simply, but know, know that we, O oh God, would tremble. That we may know that we stand right before him who knows all things. How encouraging to know that you've instilled even goodness into our hearts. And all the things we do before you faithfully, you see. O oh God, I pray, make it of great use that we would be cautious of all the things that we entertain unto your glory. We are naked before you. Search us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Rise to you.